Hi, it's good to see you today. We're studying chapters 19 and 20 of 2 Samuel. We're almost at the end. Busy, busy people all over the place. Interesting stories. Interesting things happening. Let's pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you make us. Help us to rely on you, to trust you, to go to you, and to believe that you care and answer prayer. Guide us as we go through today's lesson, we ask in Jesus' name. The day of David's return to power was a day of mourning the loss of his son. His behavior and attitude set the tone for his soldiers. They acted like losers instead of winners. Joab knew what it was like to be frustrated by David's behavior. He rebuked David for his insensitivity to his officers and people. Joab said it looked like David would have been delighted if Absalom had lived and all of them had died. He urged David to go before the troops and assure them that he appreciated their selfless service to him. Biblical commentator Dale Davis suggests a deeper dimension to David's grief. It's David's guilt that magnifies his grief. Recall chapter 12, verse 10. The sword will not depart from your house forever. Nathan had assured David that he would not die, but that his infant son would die. And he did in chapter 12. Then Amnon was murdered in chapter 13. And now Absalom has perished. David knew it was his sin that caused the sword of death to take the members of his family. David was the guilty one, but Absalom suffered the consequences of David's guilt. Of course, this doesn't remove Absalom's own guilt. What was left of Absalom's army made their way home and began bickering among themselves. The people described their own political pickle the king has delivered us from the grip of the enemy, and he has rescued us from the grip of the Philistines. Yet now he's fled from the land because of Absalom. <laughs> but Absalom, whom we anointed over us, has died in the battle. And so why are we keeping silent about bringing back the king? They had rallied behind Absalom, but now he was dead. David had been an effective leader in the past, so why weren't the elders bringing the king back? David couldn't help but notice the indecisiveness of the local officials. So he sent for Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, to ask why they were reluctant to restore him as a king. David saw that the people were willing and ready to restore him. David told the priests to promise Amasa, commander of Absalom's army that he would succeed Joab, also David's nephew, through another half-sister, as commander of the army. Joab was now completely discredited in David's eyes because he had openly disagreed with David's policies. Absalom's revolt had erupted in the heart of Judah, in Hebron, that couldn't have happened without some Judean support. Moreover, Ahithophel, David's turncoat counselor, was from Judah, as was Amasa, whom Absalom appointed general. Back in chapter 9 with, with Mephibosheth and with Hanan in chapter 10, David showed his Hesed ways. Hesed is not merely an emotion or a feeling, as we studied, but involves action on behalf of someone who is in need. Hesed describes a sense of love and loyalty, or as it's expressed in most English translations, loving kindness. But right now, David was not feeling the love. Absalom had won significant support within Judah. 
So the group had every reason to expect that if David returned, life might not be all fun and games for them. There may have been a guilt-ridden reason why no word had reached David from Judah. Many of them likely feared that David would return with an axe rather than a scepter. Hence, David's appeal and reassurance were precisely what was needed. This was a signal that those in Judah had, who had supported Absalom need fear any retribution from David. Basically, the argument reveals the fickleness of the people who had first pretty much actively supported the rebellion of Absalom. But it also indicates the depth of the break between Israel and Judah, which eventually produced two separate kingdoms. The mission removing Joab as commander, assigned to Zadok and Abiathar, was successful. As if they were united as one, the people of Judah not only invited David to return to rule over them, but they sent a delegation to the Jordan River to meet him and help him over the river. The group included Shimei, who had cursed David on his way into exile, and Ziba, Mephibosheth's ser servant, who had given David refreshment along the way. Shimei realized he was now potentially in <clears throat> deep doo-doo since David was being restored, so he came to King David and asked forgiveness, which David temporarily granted him over the objections of Abishai. The large number of Benjamites who accompanied Shimei and who were recognized as part of the whole house of Joseph, or Israel, showed the first steps of the tribe of Benjamin to link itself with Judah. There's definitely strife between Judah and Israel. All the people of Judah, along with half the people of Israel, brought the king over Jordan. Both sides had irrational arguments as to which side had the most buy-in with David. This fiasco was not the fault of David's politics, but of the reaction of Israel to the way he returned, and of Judah's reaction to Israel's reaction. This negative situation, however, carries a positive witness. This kingdom must truly be the kingdom of God, or it would have self-destructed long before. And now, finally, we get to see what's really up with Mephibosheth. We've been wondering since chapter 16 what might have happened to him and Shimei. Mephibosheth came to David and told him that Ziba had lied about Mephibosheth's motive for staying in Jerusalem when David left. Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth, said he had not been trying to bring back Saul's dynasty, like Ziba said. We don't know for sure if this is the truth. But David was somewhat convinced and agreed to return half of the estate he had threatened to take from Mephibosheth. Then there's Shimei. He openly admits his wrong, duh. But he did bring a thousand other Benjamites with him to jump back on David's bandwagon. Abashi wanted to put Shimei's head in a bucket to be carried off, but David didn't want that kind of assistance just then. Let's be realistic. Shimei didn't submit to David out of love but out of policy. Then Barzeli, the Giladite, who had provided David and his group supplies when they crossed into Transjordan, presented himself to King David. Grateful to the 80-year-old for all his goodness, David urged him to move to Jerusalem and live out his days at no personal expense. Barzeli asked that his son, King him, go to his place as he preferred to die in his own land and David was happy to honor his request. Finally, David and all those with him crossed the Jordan and arrived at Gilgal. The people were in need of cheerleaders, but everyone was depressed. It was a bad state of affairs. The man who had led the rebellion had been slain, but David wasn't rejoicing. The people saw the greatest grief David had ever expressed. Those who had gone over to Absalom's side didn't know what to do now that he was dead. They decided the best thing was to bring the king back. Apparently, 
Even in the tribe of Judah, there had been a great defection to Absalom. Now David is so disturbed at Absalom's death, and there was a unanimous desire to return David to his throne. Shimei had cursed David when he left, but now he wants to be the first one to welcome the king back. Fortunately, David was a man who could forgive. Some wanted to kill Shimei for his insults to David, but David takes the high road. He's satisfied that God has restored him as king of Israel and has no interest in getting even with Shimei. There are many Christians today who let little things bother us way too much. We shouldn't let little people bother us. Do you have trouble with fellow church members? Forget about it. We serve a mighty God. God is on our side. Live above the small irritations and serve the Lord. Focus on that. Make sure that is what you are doing. If you are serving the Lord, you don't get irritated at all the little things. We need to live above the annoying things. David's decision concerning Shimei was that he didn't intend to punish him. In fact, David did not intend to deal with this man at all in any way. The animosity between the Israelites and the Judean groups at Gilgal became so heated that Sheba, a Benjamite, announced a revolutionary movement against David, another one, and led the Israelites to desert him. David and the Judeans continued on toward Jerusalem alone. When he got home, David reasserted his kingly claims by regathering his harem. He provided for them but stayed away from them because they had been claimed by Absalom. Mephibosheth, in deep appreciation to David, refused to join the new rebellion. He remained loyal to David, and during all this time, he fasted and prayed for the king. It's wonderful to have friends like that. Mephibosheth tells David, If you think I have betrayed you, then do to me as you please. I have no right to ask any other favor of you at all. Mephibosheth proved his sincerity to David by being willing to give up all the land David had given him. The first order of business for David was to stop Sheba's insurrection. David ordered his new commander, Amasa, to reorganize the army of Judah in three days. <laughs> yeah, like that could happen. So Abishai, at David's command, took his own personal elite troops and set out for the north. They joined Amasa at Gibeon, about five miles north of Jerusalem. Joab had been demoted and replaced by Amasa. When Joab saw him, he greeted Amasa warmly, and then he killed him. Joab and Amasa were cousins, sons of two of David's half-sisters. Joab got revenge for his loss of position, and the prophecy of Nathan came to pass yet again. The sword will never depart from your house. Joab took command at once, but the troops kept stopping in the road to look at Amasa's corpse. So what was he going to do? Good solution. Drag the body to a field and throw a garment over it, not even burying him. Then he called in reinforcements and marched them northwest to Dan, where he located Sheba safe behind the city wall prepared to face a long siege. Joab was trying to batter down the walls when a wise woman from the city yelled over the wall, Hey, I want to talk with you. She told Joab she had a reputation of being pretty wise and wanted to know why he was destroying her city, which had always been loyal to Israel. He told her he actually only wanted Sheba, the rebel who was trying to lead Israel away from his, its king, and not the city. This wise woman wasted no time, and pretty soon the head of Sheba was thrown over the wall to Joab, who stopped the siege and returned to Jerusalem. Joab appears at the end of chapter 20 in the list of David's royal administers, administrators. So, David must have accepted Joab's assassination of Amasa. 
Joab remained in charge of Israel's entire force throughout the rest of what was going on. He was, until Benaniah became the leader in 1 Kings when he replaced Joab. Zadok and Abiathar remained as chief priests. And finally, Ira the Jerite was David's special minister, having succeeded David's own sons. Long, hard lessons we force God to teach us. If only we could always behave and listen and go to him. Oh, well. You know how much I like Charles Stanley's life lessons. We've got a couple of them here. Yeah. Five, I think. Chapter 19, verse 4. Oh, my son Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Although David did everything he could to protect him, Absalom still lost his life. That's what always happens when a person harbors unforgiveness and revenge in his heart. He hurts the people around him unnecessarily and eventually destroys himself. Chapter 16, verse 3. He's staying in Jerusalem, for he said, Today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. Ziba lied about Mephibosheth and used bribery to gain the king's favor and so gained a financial boon. But he would find out that whatever you acquire outside of God's will just turns to ashes. Chapter 20, verse 1. Sheba, the son of Bitri, a Benjamite, said, We have no portion in David. As a Benjamite, Sheba would have been a kinsman of Saul and undoubtedly resented David taking the throne from his tribe. He stirred up tribal jealousies, as Absalom had done, to turn the people against the king. Here we see how Saul and Absalom's evil influences continued to resonate among the people and poison them against God's appointed king, even long after Saul and Absalom had died. Psalms 4, 8. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. David wrote this psalm during a time of great distress, possibly while Saul was pursuing him, or after Absalom's betrayal, or during the rebellion of Sheba. The stress could have caused David to be restless and wakeful. Yet he was able to sleep well because he knew the Lord would keep him safe. God wants us to have the same kind of confidence and peace and to let it take root in us. Second Kings 2, 32. The Lord will return his blood on his own head because he fell upon two men more righteous and better than he and killed them. Joab finally received his punishment for killing Abner in 2 Samuel 3.27 and Amasa in 2 Samuel 29 and 10. No one ultimately gets away with any sinful act. As Paul writes, the sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow them after. 1 Timothy 5, 24. Now we have some final thoughts from J. Vernon. Think about this. The news of Absalom's death was a real heartbreak to David. And he was extremely grieved when the boy died. 
Why did this death affect David so much? There are several reasons. First of all, J. Vernon thinks David wasn't sure about the salvation of Absalom. When his first son by Bathsheba became very sick, David fasted and prayed for him. When David got word that the little boy had died, he got off his knees, bathed, worshipped, and prepared for a good dinner. That's a very different reaction to the news of Ab than to the news of Absalom's death. David said to his servants then, I'm going to him someday. He will not return to me, but it will be a great day when I go to him. He knew where the little fellow was. However, he was not sure of Absalom's salvation. McGee believes that David felt his son was not saved, and that's why he was so stricken with grief. Secondly, even though David was a great king, he was a poor father, and he knew it. He never quite succeeded in being the father he should have been, and Absalom was evidence of this failure. So, we end our time today with a paradox. A safe kingdom and a sad king. Maybe there's a reason why, at last, that God himself must wipe away every tear from our eyes. From the Old Testament in Isaiah 25, 8, He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces, and he will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And from the New Testament, Revelation 21, 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. That's great news. Give your tears to God. He's got you covered. And someday there will be no more tears ever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for the lives of every person mentioned Thank you that you love us. You want the best for us. And sometimes we don't make that so easy for you. We pray that as we go from here today, we'll remember the things you want us to remember. And we will remember mostly to thank you for who you are, for what you do for us, and to listen to your word and follow what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's good to be with you. Take care. Bye-bye.